Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. If you could please take your seats, we will begin our showcase. Uh, before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners on the land in, on which we meet, the Ngunnawal peoples. It is upon their ancestral lands that we gather here today. As we share our own knowledge, learning and research practices within Geoscience Australia, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and traditions of the Ngunnawal peoples. My name is Alicia. I'll be your MC today. For those of you who joined us at the previous showcase, welcome back. It's good to see you again. For those of you joining us for the first time, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Geoscience Australia for our first Digital Earth Australia public showcase of 2020. We want this showcase to be a chance for everyone here to engage with us, which is why we'll pause for questions following each presentation. Um, so I ask you to please wait until then to ask any questions. We are recording the session today, so please use your outside voice while you ask the questions so that we can pick it up on the camera. There will also be a number of Digital Earth Australia staff who will hang around following uh, the showcase, so please feel free to come up, introduce yourselves, um, have a chat. We'd love to get your feedback about the showcases and what we can do to improve them throughout the rest of the year. For this showcase, we have four, four speakers and topics which represent many aspects of the work that we do, including our recent achievements and how we deliver the Digital Earth Australia program. Our first presentation includes a special guest and friend from the CSIRO. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Steve Sager, one of our DEA Assistant Directors of Product Development, um, to introduce our guest speaker and the Eye on Water Citizen Science Project. Thanks, Alicia. So around the middle of last year, uh, DEA, in collaboration with CSIRO, kicked off our Inland Water Quality Program. Um, it's a program that goes for two and a half years, and really the aim is to try and support those state and federal agencies which work in the water quality space. Um, our aim is to try and demonstrate the potential of taking what is really a, at this point, um, experimental and research-based approach to water quality from remote sensing, and seeing what we can do to upscale that and to get into an operational mode. And this will be to demonstrate to those users um, the benefits of trying to integrate these types of products into their monitoring workflows and use them as a sort of a complementary product um, alongside the in-situ monitoring that they invest in so strongly. This is across a range of applications, things like harmful algal blooms, and as you'll probably see in Janet's presentation more recently, looking at things like impacts from the recent fire events. The stuff that Janet's going to talk to us about today is probably one of the most exciting things that's come out of the program thus far, um, and it's the citizen science component of the work that SIRO is bringing to the project. It's fundamentally a different way of looking at water quality, um, engaging with the community using phone-based apps and looking at water colour and trying to see how we can integrate that with our traditional science approaches. So Janet leads that, um, has been leading it for a couple of years within SIRO. She's the team leader of the Aquatic Remote Sensing Program there. And without further ado, Janet. Thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be here to talk about the project. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, it's really building on uh, some of the fundamentals that we've been developing at CSIRO, but also at Geoscience Australia. And that's really been looking at the analysis ready data that uh, G DEA have, has been able to produce, along with the bio-optical modelling that we've been undertaking for water quality assessment at CSIRO. And one of this project is, is looking at bringing in non-traditional data sources like citizen science and see what we can use with that data and pr hopefully provide some validation for the water quality type products. What we're hoping to do is bring this all together onto the DEA platform and have a flexibility about it so that we can integrate other models and other data sources into this um, type of work. <coughs> The outputs really are, we're looking at developing operational style outputs for state agencies and water-based um, monitoring uh, agencies. Uh, so water quality issues are topical at the moment, uh, you know, over the last few uh, months and uh, we've had the bushfire impacts where we've had significant flows of ash coming down the riverways and having 
we susp uh, suppose long-term damage to, to those ecosystems. Over the past few summers, we've had algal blooms and, and massive fish deaths in, in um, particularly the Darling River. So these are really significant events that uh, garnered the interest of uh, the wider population. So remote sensing is seen as a really good tool to actually pick up some of these impacts um, that we're seeing in our waterways. You know, the remote sensor, the satellite, um, is really seeing the water surface reflectance. And after all the atmospheric uh, influences are removed from the data, really what's left is what's in the water column and how it absorbs and scatters the light. And how it does that is really um, a, a function of what's in the water column. So in the water column, we can get uh, things like dissolved organics, as, as this photo shows, where we've got clear water but it's, it's highly coloured and it's full of organic rich material. In this example we've got lots of sediment in the water column in, in, including any light penetration influencing the, the, the uh, macrophytes that are in the system. We've got areas like rainforest where we've got a, a great uh, slurry of, of nutrients, sediments, organics and uh, phytoplankton in the water. And we, where we have areas where we have low flow and high solar radiation, we get often algal blooms forming on, on these riverways, like in uh, Lake Kim here, oh, Lake Ranger. We also get algal blooms from uh, harmful algal blooms, like this microcystis bloom, that colour the water a, a, a dark or a bright green. In coastal areas, we have greenish waters and we, we see those lovely green, clear waters, and in tropical areas we have turquoise. And then when we're lucky enough to get off the continental shelf, we get the navy blue waters of, of the ocean. A really vast range and diversity of colours, which we can categorise together into a colour, we can categorise by a colour scale. In this um, pharrell yule scale, which was developed several, uh, quite a long time ago, it has 21 colours that allows us to categorise all those natural colours that are found in, in nature by this colour scale. And most recently there's been a couple of publications that have allowed us to take this colour scale and apply it not only to the satellite data but to citizen science acquired photographs. And this gives us a great idea about using uh, this data, this colour scale for validating what we do in remote sensing of aquatic systems. So building on the work that was undertaken in Europe, we developed an Iron Water Australia app where we uh, encourage and train users to go out there and take photographs of water surfaces. And in this way, we can use this data to, to monitor what's going on in their systems. For, for users that are particularly interested, we can also supply additional um, kit for them to give physical, additional physical and chemical parameters which we can also add to our database. And this gives us a range of um, information that otherwise is non-existing in this country. So one of the things that scientists always ask, well how good is satellite is citizen science data after all? And so what, what we did do is compare at 13 sites the citizen science acquired data with um, uh, a radiometric data that had been converted to the same scale. And we got reasonably good correlation with the data. Additionally, we had a look at uh, the estimation of users' um, colours uh, with the algorithm that uh, determines the, the colour. And we found that there was very little deviation between the user's uh, estimation and the algorithm that determines the colour. So this gives us increasing confidence in, in being able to utilise this data with known uncertainty. So our current work is really looking at developing visualisation metrics to improve the user's experience in, in uh, using this app, but also to give them more information about the system that they're monitoring. Additionally, we're developing a framework for integration of this data into uh, the national map and, and DEA aquatic products. So finding ways of using all that additional chemical and physical information as well as the, the colour photographs. 
So an example of how we can use this data is when we apply the Ferrell-Yule uh, colour index to Landsat time series data, we can, we've done this for two lakes, Lake Hume and Lake Billy Griffin, which I think you may all be familiar with, and we can split this data up in terms of seasonality. So we can have a look at um, what are the major colours that we're seeing at each um, major season. We can also see where we're not collecting so much data, like over winter, in both of those areas. But when we look at the temporal information, we're, we're getting to start to see process, um, ecosystem processes um, unpacked. And in, in the Lake Valley Griffin data, we, we can see clearly that at the end of the um, millennial drought and the, the big turbid plumes coming into um, the lake at that point. And this gives us really good information that when we link it with the, with the citizen science data that has a time, location and colour index, we can then validate that retrieval from the satellite remote sensing. So Steve has also processed a Sentinel-2 image with the Ferrell-Yule um, index. And the interesting thing about this is it gives you the spatial variability um, that the Ferrell-Yule colour provides to the user. So it's, in, it's actually quite instructive to do this, to see the variability. And then again, we can have a direct comparison with the citizen science data and look at the dates and, and match it up to the imagery. So the other work that we're doing is really our physics-based retrieval models. And this work uh, we've been doing for us the last couple of um, decades. And what we have done recently is look at, at the in-situ data that we've collected in the field in terms of the colour. So looking at the dissolved organics uh, against the sediments and phytoplankton and characterising them based on their dominant um, constituent. And from the coastal and inland water data that we've got, we've done a forward model to simulate a remote sensing reflectance from the data. And then we'll be able to cluster them into um, optical water types that we see in, that occur naturally around Australia. One of the things that we had just finished was taking these optical water types, generating a set of inherent optical properties that have been generalised for Australia. And this is important because then that generalised um, data set will enable us to integrate it operational continental scale um, model. So we've, as an example of the Pharrell-Yule index that we've applied to the satellite imagery in Sentinel-2, we've taken 800 pixel drills through eastern Australia and looked at what is the variability of those waters um, over the Sentinel-2 period of time, so from 2016 to the current time. And from this type of work, we can detect trend and pick up variability and events like black water events or the, the ash flows. So we think that this type of approach will add benefit to um, the end user and the management authorities. So what we've found is that the DEA platform is really ideal to capture but also track those types of events. We can see those ash flows going down the river system and, and tell management authorities you're going to get it in a couple of days' time. Uh, it, it's important for that type of work. We know that we, we are going to need additional observation data in order to increase that, um, the applicability to the continental um, work, but we do know that physics-based approaches will provide us with accurate retrievals um, of those concentrations that we need. The Pharrell colour method, um, it will give us uh, colour observations which we then can link to, to the citizen science measurement. But the real benefit of what we're doing is that this integrated approach together with traditional validation data will give us the best chance of producing an accurate continental scale water quality product. So validation is key, as you all know. And, uh, we would really encourage you to help us along those efforts and then download the app and, and take photos of your local model app. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Can you do it with a drone? <laughs> <laughs> when? 
No, but, but what you can do, Mark, is um, you can convert the data to a Pharrell Yule or a Hugh Angle, which is, if you read the, the Van der Waart, um, Van der Waart um, paper, you can actually create a Hugh Angle product, which you can then add to your database additionally. But it's one of those areas of development I'd really love to, to see happen, uh, but at the moment, no. Yeah, um, one of the, the criticisms um, I had early on was, is, is the Pharrell Yule scale sufficient for, for uh, monitoring water, uh, water colour variations? And um, having um, seen the, 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 the ash flows and, and actually physically monitored those uh, or measured those, uh, it, I was really surprised to see it fits within that scale. So using the Pharrell Yule scale, I was actually able to use the using the, the sentinel imagery. I was actually able to track the flow of the the plume down the waterway, and then see it as it got into Lake Burrinjuk, um, see it change Pharrell Yule. So as it's mixing, so it gives you that sort of system dynamic. Adam, uh, is the Pharrell Yule just just the inland waters? Or no, it, if you have a look at the historical data set, it goes back to the late 19th century, so there's thousands and thousands of perennial measurements taken. It's been used for oceanography as well as limnology. Yeah, um, my project is just for Australia, but um, I work very closely with the Europeans, which um, op operate it globally. So um, one of the, the fundamental bases of citizen science is to have open access to data, and all that data is available. It, you simply go to the website and download it as a CSV file. So it's pretty unwieldy, but it's available. <laughs> and, and a lot of the historical data has um, corresponding water clarity or second depth measurements undertaken with it, so it has that added benefit. Rodrigo, welcome. Um, how much impact does scope reflectance have on the FQ scale, given that um, people take pictures at different times of day, different sort of angles and viewer angles? How much impact does scope reflectance have on the FQ scale? A lot, um, but one of the first projects, the first um, bodies of work I did um, in, uh, uh, in 2017 was to uh, work further on the, there's a Wakodi algorithm that's used to, it was randomizingly, random, take random, random kernels of um, pixels from the photograph to create the Pharrell Yule index. Because there's two, I don't know if you picked that up, but there's two Pharrell Yule indexes that are um, created for each one, the user Pharrell Yule and the estimated Pharrell Yule. And there's a Wakodi algorithm that calculates that from a randomised sample. I had some um, uh, scientific computing support and they uh, had a look at uh, how to optimise that because what we were finding was that some parts of the, the photograph was actually influenced by sky glint or glint of the water surface. So it, it was um, um, making the, the retrieval somewhat inaccurate. So by taking a centre pixel, you assume that um, the, that's the, cent the most flat part of the spectrum, fl sorry, flat part of the acquisition, um, then uh, we found that by randomising that, we get a better estimation of Pharrell Yule. But yes, it does impact. There's other apps that take, um, get the user to take a photograph of a standard grey panel and then calculate a reflectance from that. But the uptake of that project is much less than what iron water is. So it's a, a cost benefit. Thank you.
leave. Janet's going to hang around for a little bit after the showcase. So if anybody wants to come and have a chat to her, please do so while she's here. Our next speaker is going to talk to us about the land cover classification system. Did I get that right? Yeah, I did. Um, so welcome, Belle Tissot, to tell us how DEA is producing an annual land cover map of the entire Australian continent. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the project and um, an update on whereabouts it's at. So firstly, uh, why? Why are we making a land cover product? Um, we're lucky in Australia to have an extremely diverse landscape. However, given the size of our country, um, understanding the state and condition of our environment and um, identifying options for future management is extremely challenging. So how do we monitor the health of our environment and see how it's changing over time? How can we know if measures that we're putting in place to um, improve our environment are actually doing what we want them to be doing? And land cover maps play a significant role in planning, management and monitoring programs at local, regional and national scales. So Australia is screaming out for robust national land cover information and this is why we're producing this new product which is a, not only a land cover maps but also change, um, change detection systems. <clears throat> so when thinking about this um, project, um, I realised there's four driving principles which have been guiding us along the way and um, well, initially um, standardised. We want the product to be um, standard in the way that it classifies the, um, the land into groups so that this can be applicable um, broadly across um, Australia but also broadly um, people can use it in other countries or for local regional things. We want it to be easily updatable. It's really important that um, this doesn't immediately go out of date. We have new sensors coming online with satellites. We have new algorithms being developed to um, classify um, different environmental variables and we don't want this system to be static in the way that it handles these. So we need to make sure that we've designed it in a way that as these new things come into play, we can easily integrate them into the system that we've built. And last, uh, continental scale, obviously. Um, the maps that we're making are um, for all of Australia, we're aiming to make uh, annual continental products that go back through our entire Landsat archive. And lastly, collaboration. We can't do this alone. We can't, we're not going to make this in isolation and hope that people want to use it. It's really important to us that we're making something that's going to be of value to um, the public, to um, other government agencies, to anybody that wants this information, that it's going to feed in the right information to these people. So this is huge. This is the Food and Agriculture Organisation's land cover classification system taxonomy. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, this is what we're using to group into um, our, our maps into classes. You don't need to understand it all. Basically, um, you know, global standard tick. This is making it applicable and broad. Um, it's the way that we're implementing this, which is achieving um, the second thing of making it easily updatable. So what we're doing is we're, um, if you look at the first part of the FAO's land cover classification taxonomy, you can see it's a pretty simple decision tree structure. But what we're doing is making each of these decisions independently of each other so that you can switch in better methodologies as they become available. So what we'll do is go, okay, is this pixel vegetated or not vegetated? And that's all we look at initially. And then we'll get that afterwards and we'll go, okay, we've got a water layer and we bring in all of the information that we can to define water in the landscape and we go, okay, is it now wet or dry? Um, similarly, on the vegetated side, we'll then look at whether it's cultivated or whether it's a natural area. And um, over here we look at whether the bare surfaces are um, urban or natural and the same for aquatic, although we're not looking at um, artificial aquatic areas at the moment because from remote sensing this is super challenging. Um, but in doing it in this way, say we come up with a better method for urban classification, we can just put that new method in and it doesn't impact our vegetation classification that we've already got or our water classification that we're really happy with. So 
Um, this enables us to bring in these new methods as they come up and keep it really up to date. Um, so this gives us our base uh, eight classes of um, land cover and then the FAO define a whole heap of extra attributes that you can put onto those eight classes to get an even better understanding of the environment. Uh, we've, the way that we've implemented this is very much the same in that every one of these attributes can be um, added to the classification using an individual layer. So we, we've built it so that it can handle all of them. We don't have data for all of them right now. We just have data for some of these. If we come up with a new method to um, create a classification for something we don't currently have, like crop combination, we can feed that in at a later date and add that to the system. Or if we have a better method for identifying life form, we can feed that in as well. So easily updatable. <laughs> um, continental mapping. So we've already built the um, application and the workflow around being able to create continental maps. We can now run and create um, full continental um, land cover maps of Australia, and we have done so for two years, um, 2010, 2015. So now that we can create these, the work goes into improving the layers that we're putting into building these. I'm going to address the elephant in the room. Uh, this is artificial surfaces. Yes, it says that there's artificial surfaces in the middle of Australia. We're working on that layer. Um, <laughs> but it's focusing on what we have done and where we're actually at. This is a massive achievement. This is huge. Not just in these maps are actually huge, but this is significantly um, improved the amount of information that we can get out of the land cover, like compared to the land cover classifications that we've currently got. This is already providing an insane amount more information. So this is our current land cover product, um, the continental land cover product. As you can see, it's pretty pixely. It's a 250 metre product. Um, what we've done to do some comparisons um, and have a look at how far we've come is we've, we've got some areas of that um, land cover product and we've mapped each of those classes to the FAOs, LCCS, um, those, those base eight classes. Um, and so here you can see um, the dark green is um, natural vegetation, the light green is um, cropped areas, you've got a little bit of brown which is bare soil and a few little um, water areas. The new map that we have, you can see it's Sydney. We have the whole city coming up here and we can actually look at the um, the urban sprawl, we can map these over the years and see how much this urban area has changed throughout the whole time series that we have of our Landsat archives. Um, another example, vegetation and a little bit of uh, bare soil and a blob of water, but we have actually Melbourne. And we, you can see there's a river coming in, it's not just a blob of water. You can even see um, here we have sewage treatment plants coming up that you can see down the bottom. So it's a pretty significant difference um, and an amazing amount more information that we're able to provide to people already. One more because I love these examples. Um, yeah, it's green, some sort of green area. There's you know, natural and um, cropping areas and a little blob of you know, water there. But actually what you can see in the new land cover product is there's a river running through here and you can see that in a fair bit of detail and there's a small town here at the bottom. So being able to provide this extra information to people is... Um, a significant, um, I, I feel like we've made a massive step forward already and yes, there's improvements to be made but we've got to stop and appreciate how far we've come because this is incredible. So what next? Urban improvements? Um, <laughs> so yes, we're working on that urban layer and um, obviously getting rid of all those cities that are in the middle of Australia. Um, we have improvements to our vegetation, the vegeta veg not veg layer, which is going to ensure that we are picking up more of the non-photosynthetic veg, so the, um, the brown grasses and things that we're missing a little bit in Central Australia. Um, and both of these improvements should be in the next continental runs that we do just in the next few weeks. Um, validation. We heard already that validation is super important. So, so far where we've been at is we've been building the whole um, 
system and the improvements to our layers that we've been putting in have been, you know, it's, oh, we can eyeball it and go, that needs fixing. But now we need to, we're developing a system so that we can do um, robust validation and um, ensure the quality of the products that we're um, providing. And change mapping. So once we have um, two land, land cover images, we can compare the two and see what's changed over between the two periods. Um, we can already do that. We've got the code in place to do the comparisons between these images, but that's not really what's important. What's important here is, um, is the value that you get out of it. So if you've got a lot of classes and you're comparing them, there are a lot of changes that you're um, showing to somebody. And we want to make sure this is valuable to the person that needs this information. So what we're actually doing is working with partners to make sure that the, the changes of interest are highlighted and that we can provide this to them in a way that um, is useful for their decision-making processes. Collaboration. This is like my happy loving moment um, because this has been an incredible project and um, we honestly couldn't do this without the incredible support. Big projects like this don't happen when you sit in isolation and do work in your little bubble and this isn't just the collaboration of the team that I'm working in or the DEA team as a whole who have been absolutely fabulous and supportive but also our partners across government who have been amazing and have seen the vision that we've got here and can see how valuable this product's going to be and are working with us to make sure that we understand their needs and we're developing a product that will be useful long term for them and they're really taking the time to work through that with us and without that it just wouldn't happen. So yeah, that's my happy moment at the end. Thanks. <laughs> We are, there is work going into um, improving the layer that we put in for the um, crop mapping and that will use more spatial stuff so that, because crops are obviously have these shapes um, and there has been talk around um, adding that sort of uh, information for mapping urban areas as well because obviously um, there's a lot of um, distinction you can get in those urban areas. At the moment we're just using spectral signatures. What's your accuracy? Uh, the, the current land cover map? Oh, the one that you the, Yeah. Um, I don't know what the accuracy of the LCD is. <laughs> Top of my head. Yeah, I like 60%. I'm going to destroy him. <laughs> Another question for Trevor? Oh. <laughs> At the moment, urban has been our biggest challenge, yeah. Um, the shiny, non-changing areas in the middle of Australia look awfully, like the spectral signature is just very, very similar to um, the actual urban signatures. Um, and the difficulty we're having is because it is a continental product. So um, at a small scale, training a model to, to identify urban areas and running it over a city, you get beautiful results. As soon as you want to run something, we want something that runs consistently across all of Australia and through time. So this is the bit where we're, like, it's just taking that bit longer to make sure it's robust and we're looking at all of the things that can go wrong and will go wrong. Um, <laughs> Oh, they're all kittens now. That is fantastic. Um, uh, feeding into policy decisions. Um, there's a work going into um, ec and the economic accounts for um, environmental economic accounting. And we've been working with the Department of Environment to make sure that the information we're providing can help feed into these accounts. Um, we have um, collaborators at um, University of New South Wales who are working to make sure that this feeds into policy and hopefully can be used for things like reporting on sustainable development goal indicators um, because having these consistent, um, robust um, land cover information, it feeds perfectly into a lot of the indicators that we need to report on and some of them that we've had trouble getting accurate information to report on to date. Just one quick question, when you go to the labelling group, any public classification, you always have to look at current and the like. Is there no 
know, like you're mislabeling of the, the salt flakes in the middle of Australia. So no decision rule, and just arbitrarily help the wind nose in the right place. Like you, you're not using... We're not... There's no sort of, I suppose, GIS overlay out there. Yeah, we... I mean, the thing is, like, we, we did have a look at things like using open street maps to um, basically block out areas that didn't have any sort of mapping. But because we're looking at such a long time period and things change and we end up with small cities or small towns, like mining towns and things appearing in these areas, we would prefer to try and pick these up and not pick up um, the, like, not just blanket block out the incorrect areas. Uh, not yet. This is what we're working on at the moment is how we go about validation and coming up with a robust validation method. So we don't have that yet. Um, our collaborators in, at the University of Aberystwyth in Wales um, are using the same application to map land cover in Wales. Um, they've also developed an app which they use for, to get ground truth data and they can, we can validate against that. So we can use this app as well. It's fantastic and it's set through the exact same um, Classification, it walks you through classifying where you're standing into that tree so you can get that sort of data, if we can get that to spread um, across and get some citizen science happening, that would be amazing um, for validation. Getting validation data is often challenging. Thank you, Belle. Thank you. I'm reluctant to leave the kittens. <laughs> um, but there we go, sorry. Uh, our next speaker is going to talk to us about DEA hotspots. I'd like to welcome Simon Oliver, um, the Director of Earth and Marine Observations Operations to the stage to tell us about this National Bushfire Monitoring System. Thank you, Simon. All right. Uh, thanks, Alicia. I hope you're all doing well. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Digital Earth Australia hotspots, which is uh, something we've launched ahead of uh, the recent bushfire events. Um, so basically just giving you an overview of our experience during that process and how we went about it. So I'll give you a bit of background to hotspots to start with, um, talk about some of the planned updates and what we've currently been working through in this program of work, uh, a summary of the hotspots and our experience during the southern bushfire events, the impact of what we've been doing in terms of how that's been taken up by others and uh, how it's been utilised and what's next in terms of the work program around this activity. So just to start things off, I'm uh, going to have a show of hands who, who's heard about and used DEA uh, hotspots. Okay, and out of view, who's used that application on their phone? Okay, so I'll, I'll refer to this again as we get through the, uh, through the discussion, but it's an interesting thing to, to look at in terms of how people utilise uh, this, this particular application. Uh, so we're also working on a collaboration with uh, uh, our counterparts in Western Australia who also operate a national scale hotspots program. Um, and that's towards a national hotspots um, system, one that covers uh, both, both of those use cases. Uh, for the DEA hotspots example, we launched that in October ahead of the bushfires uh, and have had this and its predecessor application, the Sentinel hotspots, running in parallel since then. Uh, there's a public site and a secure site. The secure site is targeted for emergency management uh, and has additional resources in it that are not available to, to the public. And something that we've been focused on quite heavily is um, allowing people to understand what, what is an appropriate use of the system. So we've done a fair bit of work to um, make that front and centre in terms of the first thing that people see when they come to the site, in that it's, it's not published in real time and it, and it shouldn't be used for safety of life decision making. So what are hotspots? They're areas of high temperature um, uh, determined through an analysis of a satellite image. Uh, these satellites take periodic snapshots of the Earth and they don't image the same, uh, same area continuously, they take snapshots. Uh, for a hotspot to be detected, a cloud and smoke free unobstructed view is required of the target. And hotspots are updated several times each day uh, and they're available typically within 30 minutes of the overpass of the satellite. So it's important to understand that not every hotspot actually displays and not every hotspot is actually fire. So uh, the thing we've had difficulty with is trying to explain to people the coverage and frequency of acquisitions. So um, just showing this as a single day coverage of what the satellites see over Australia. Uh, 
as a bit of an indicator in terms of what, what sensors are picking up um, different parts of the country during, during different times of the day. And as you can see, we have a quite a good coverage um, based on the satellites that we have available uh, on the, on the right-hand side of this diagram. In terms of the updates to the tool, um, we're basically working on a continuous update process. So as we get input from users, we try to roll that out as a, an improvement to the system. So we're really focused on trying to make it a good, good system for users and be really reactive to, to the input that we're getting from people. Um, some of the enhancements we've made of recent times that include uh, near real-time data feeds through the DEA program uh, to help supplement the information available to users of the system. Uh, and that includes things like um, a measurement tool as well for, for additional capability in there. And uh, a number of different formats uh, of data to download as well to cater for people's different requirements. Uh, this is just an example of how we're using the Sentinel-2 near real-time data as a backdrop to, to understanding the movement of the fire. Um, so this is two dates represented here, five days apart, uh, and then using the measurement tool to, to determine how, how far that fire front's moved within those five days. So uh, 10, 10 kilometres in this case. Uh, in terms of other things, uh, we're working on some uh, hotspot time series animations. That's got a big thing in the media, is to have um, a visualisation of the web capability, and a lot of this work was done through uh, uh, Robbie, who will be presenting shortly after me. Um, hotspot animation was an, an additional feature that we're testing in beta in the current system, uh, which has had a fair bit of interest as well in terms of understanding uh, the dynamics of the fires that they move through. Uh, also done some work to adjust the, the view that people have of the content in the system to make it easier to consume. Uh, so animations was a big thing. Uh, on the left we have the 2003 bushfires that affected Canberra, and on, on the right an animation of the the more recent fire events, just to show you the sort of visualisation functions that we've built there. So these, these animations are uh, executed on a daily basis at the moment. We're just using that as a sort of test, test at the moment to see how things go and uh, how people will engage with that. Uh, in terms of the interface itself, the inspection tool uh, has come along and, and, and it's been a, a way for us to improve and enhance the, the way that people interact with the content. Uh, another thing that we got from user feedback was uh, the need to have a persistent legend there so people can actually relate the colour of the spot to its age. Uh, so here we see a, a range from zero to two hours in dark red down to, down to yellow at 72 hours. Uh, so those hotspots can be presented throughout that 72 hour window. Um, this just gives you an idea how that information for a hotspot when you click on it's uh, rolled out and it gives you an indicator of the, the temperature. People were interested to see uh, temperature in degrees Celsius. That's been included in there as well, uh, and various other uh, minor enhancements. Uh, in terms of how we performed during the bushfire events, uh, we had quite a lot of interest. So um, I guess going into this, we didn't have a really good handle on who uses this, this system and how. Um, but we saw a real big, a, a really uh, significant in, uh, uptake of the new system when we released it, and around about a half a million users uh, during that period. Uh, we maintained pretty good uptime as well, so the, the enhancements that were made in deployment of the new system uh, have proved to be effective. Uh, but you can see in the spike here, the, you know, the early January period is when we saw a great deal of interest in these. And uh, media was all over this as well, a lot of, a lot of tweets about um, Digital Australia hotspots and, and their use. They're generally really positive, so quite a good uh, response in terms of what we've got there. Uh, and we've gone to great lengths to um, engage new users in the system as well and to draw the secure users across to this new system as well to, to ensure that they're benefiting from the service that we provide. Uh, so we learned a lot about the applications of the, the data. I guess um, it's also been used as a context to many applications. Here's just the, the fire spread model and, uh, and how that relates to the hotspots. Um, we also found that and this relates to my initial question of you, was that um, around 70% of our users actually use the system through their mobile, uh, which is, gives us a good idea of maybe where we should focus our efforts in the future in terms of the interface and its development. Uh, once again, reiterating that it's not a safety of life application, but it, it does fill an important uh, information gap. So people ha have used this in uh, where, where there's lack of information from other official sources for um, where a bushfire is, for example. Um, and it provided context as we've just gone through. The, the application must use on mobile. We've already gone through that. 
Uh, so just a quick summary, 150 emails received through GEA's various channels. Um, we respond to each one of those and we utilise that information to help improve the, the system. Uh, generally very positive. Uh, some general assumptions out there from users are that um, the base map itself, which is a, an Esri in, uh, a satellite image or compilation, is real time when it's actually not, it's just there for context. Uh, and there's various location errors within that layer as well, so that might make us move to a different layer in the future. Uh, hotspots aren't always there, that's just because of the way that the algorithm works and then cloud obscuration and various other things that impact the ability to detect a hotspot. Uh, people are quite interested to know what's coming up, so th those enhancements were uh, added to the system as we went through it as well. And a lot of people are interested in downloading hotspots for their own analysis. Uh, in future, we're engaging with the emergency management community through things like uh, MCNA, which is the Emergency Management Spatial Information Network of Australia. Uh, they have a, a, a forum there where we can gauge uh, interest in the system and places where we can improve and enhance it. Uh, we're working on how-to guides and uh, increasing the accessibility of the system through that and, and this idea of continuous improvement is something that we're building on as well. Uh, if you've got further uh, comments to make, you can feed that through our client services email contact as well and that would be useful. Uh, and as a bit of a segue into Robbie's talk, he'll be presenting next. Uh, interesting for us to understand how this, how this data is actually used by some uh, agencies, in, in this case the National Air Firefighting Centre making use of the hotspots to help underpin their, uh, their flight planning for, for where they go to, to look for uh, bushfire movement as a result of uh, some of those wind activities that are spot, spotting fires in different parts of the country. So I think that's all from me. I'll hand over to Robbie. <coughs> Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so essentially about a few months ago, right in the middle of the fire season, we were contacted by the National Aerial Firefighting Centre. Um, and so the NAFC, um, their job is basically to coordinate all of the um, bushfire um, fighting um, from helicopters, planes, um, plan it, um, work out where the planes are, where they're going, um, how much fuel they've used, sort of all the coordinating that happens behind the scenes. Um, and so what they were um, really interested in is working out if we could use satellite imagery and satellite products to help optimise um, some of their processes. So at the moment, um, every plane um, that flies up, every helicopter that goes up, they're basically making, they're getting information on where the water is after they leave. So when they fly up, um, they don't have any maps of where they're going to find water. They essentially um, fly up, circle the fire, look for water, look for dams, look for lakes, that kind of thing, and then get water that way. Um, and so this, for any given day, particularly in the middle of a big fire season, um, this, um, the aerial firefighting campaigns are using tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fuel. Um, so even if we can help optimise um, the amount of time they spend in the air and try to reduce that down with satellite data, um, there's potentially huge savings both in money from them, which means they can do more helicopter flights, more plane flights, um, and also reducing the time that they have to spend away from the fires. Um, so we... Um, Set on a little, um, set off on a little pilot study uh, to see if we can use DA hotspots data in combination with a new um, product, DA water bodies, to see if we can get um, some extra information that we can forward to the aerial firefighters to help optimise their search for water in the landscape. So here um, is some DA hotspots data from a fire near Bellingen um, on the North New South Wales coast. Um, and so what we can do basically, once we use DA hotspots data to work out where the active fire fronts are, we can then start to do some sort of simple um, geographic um, analyses to work out from that fire front what water bodies are within um, the acceptable flight range for a helicopter or a plane. And so for this example, um, we've got a buffer about 15 kilometres around the fire front, which is um, a typical range that helicopters can fly to get water. Um, but this, this sort of area that's accessible would change a lot depending on whether it's a, a larger helicopter or the various different planes they have. Um, so we can throw in all of these different stats and sort of narrow down the area that's actually accessible. Um, around those fire fronts. And so in this, um, all of the grey dots are water bodies from the DA Water Bodies product. Um, and so um, this, what this product does is essentially give a time history of um, for each water body in Australia, when it was full, when it was dry throughout time. Um, so you can see these graphs um, for this water body that's highlighted up here. Um, and so depending on whether it's full or dry, the aerial firefighters need to know that before they go out trying to search for water. It's not good enough just to know 
where the water bodies are, they need to have at least recent information on whether they were wet recently before they commit to a flare. So if you take that information, you can then start to um, take this big subset of water bodies and reduce it down to just the ones that we know with reasonable certainty were wet recently. Um, and so we can also, using the DA water bodies data, work out how big they are. And so for various different um, helicopters and um, planes, some might have a bigger requirement for water bodies that they can actually land on. And so what we've done, um, we, sort of, we were sharing some data um, with them throughout uh, the early fire season. And so this is, in white, are GPS tracks of actual helicopter flights uh, when they were fighting. Um, I think this is the fire, just the Braywood fire, just to the southeast of Canberra. Um, and you can see that all of these flights are congregating on this um, wider part of the river where DA water bodies successfully identified that there was water in the landscape. Um, and so this gives us a, it's a pretty promising hint that this kind of data in combination with hotspot data, um, satellite derived water bodies can really get some helpful information um, for fighting fires. We did have um, some issues with this. One of the main issues is at the moment that DO water bodies has uh, some sort of thresholds for how large a water body needs to be to be included in it. And what we've found is that these helicopters are usually targeting really small water bodies. Um, they'll get anything that's big enough to put a bucket in it. And you've probably seen that um, viral video of the, um, the helicopter dropping a bucket into a swimming pool. It's that kind of size of water body which they really need to know about. So at the moment, the, um, the, we think that the current Landsat-based approach might need to be supplemented with a higher resolution approach, maybe based on Sentinel data, which would get you down to about 10 meter water bodies, um, but potentially also requiring some other sort of higher resolution data sets as well. Um, and also there's an ongoing challenge of basically because everything is so smoky, it's really hard to get up-to-date information on water. So we might have to do um, something like work out water bodies that were wet at least within the last three months or something like that. Um, yeah, so a very, um, some very promising um, things now in some areas that we will have to improve for a future um, work, but yeah, watch this space. Thank you. Um, I'm just mindful of time, and I know we've got an IDC meeting next, five minutes, but um, if there's any IDC members in the room when you're ready, please follow Trent and Trevor over to your meeting. Um, but for the moment, let's ask Robbie and Simon any questions. So no, we actually <laughs> don't. But we have a, a, a confidence associated with these hotspots that allows the user to understand uh, how the algorithm perceived that as a hotspot. The temperatures here are you know, at, a, at a resolution that may not be indicative of the true temperature of burn. So you're looking at a, a mixed pixel over a one or two kilometer area as well. So I think uh, there's, there's a catch either either way with going uh, putting temperature in both Kelvin and, and degrees Celsius in that the degrees Celsius gives an idea that that's quite cold. You'll see 16 degree Celsius hotspots and people wonder how that could be possible. But it's in the context of what's, what's around it. Yeah. Yeah, 
I guess that, that's something we haven't looked at, um, something we could, we could look at. I guess the, the thing with uh, hotspots that we're conscious of it is it being a supplemental information to support emergency management. Uh, so there's, there's some boundary there, I guess, between um, what we provide as supporting information versus uh, what can be used tactically for uh, fighting fires uh, out, of, out of fine resolution. So I guess maybe that's something we need to think about, I guess, in terms of how we progress an idea like that. No, so that's uh, part of the reason it's called hotspots as well. And we, uh, there's other similar systems out there that are called active fire products, and they, they do uh, quite often do this, this the uh, screening of things that are persistent persistent industrial heat sources. Uh, whereas we put this out as a hotspot process and product, and uh, the interpretation of what that hotspot means is done by uh, an external party. I, I haven't heard anything formal about that at all, but I think for some of this, um, some of this work, Sentinel-2, particularly because we need to use the, um, the shortwave bands to get water body data, which is 20 metres, you're still already back to a reasonably large pixel. So I suspect for a lot of these applications, um, the NAFC is probably going to need something that's a bit better resolution than Sentinel. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, for you mentioned that you have Yeah, so it's basically whatever is anomalously, anomalously hot between the sensor and the ground. So that could be hot smoke. It can be a hot uh, bitumen surface or a top of a roof or an industrial furnace. Or, yeah, so those, those things uh, are complications in the interpretation of what a hotspot actually means. So yeah, there's no, no easy answer to that. Quite often, uh, if the smoke is not thick, you can see the heat signature underneath that. Uh, but if you've got thick smoke like we experienced in, uh, in the recent events, that can obscure the ability to see uh, through those clouds as well. And I guess as a follow-up, do you do local baseline averaging to be able to like, remove the island effects or something in more urban environments where you do get um, you know, your concrete surface and other things potentially creating a much higher background temperature than your vegetation areas? No, there's no... No additional screening that we do as part of that. We just put this out as a hotspot file, and it can be used by emergency managers you know, looking at uh, fire situations. But we, we put it out as a hotspot product, not a not an active fire product. Thank you guys. One more round of Well, that concludes our first DEA public showcase of 2020. We hope you enjoyed it. One more thank you to our presenters and, of course, um, a special mention to Axel, who helped to make this possible today and organise it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'd really love your feedback and we will be available to chat to you here, so please come up and introduce yourselves. Um, our contact details are on the screen if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, and if you're a visitor to Geoscience Australia, I encourage you to check out our minerals and fossils collection. And if you haven't already done so, the only lunar touchstone in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, for those of you who are heading off straight away, I wish you safe travels to your next destination. And I look forward to welcoming all of you again to our next public showcase in May. Thank you.